Thank you. Thank you. Um, first of all, let me say that uh, Lindsey Graham and I agreed on, agree on everything except one uh, minor point. I'll tell you what that is. But he's right about those of you who are conservatives and Republicans that we have lost our way to the extent that we think the green eye shade politics of deficit reduction is more important than national security. National security comes first. You do what you have to do to defend yourselves. Now, Lindsay and I are both pretty optimistic. And let me tell you the friend of mine's definition here. He said, here's the difference between the optimist and the pessimist. The pessimist says things are so bad that they can't get any worse. And the optimist says, sure they can. <laughs> Folks, this is what's going to happen with sequestration, and you know it. What I want to do for just a few minutes is to go back to the Joint Select Committee, some called it super, but it wasn't so super, explain how we got here, which helps to show the way out. I am presuming that most people here stipulate that we cannot allow the sequestration to occur, half of which will fall on the Defense Department, and would be catastrophic and devastating, and there are other words to that effect from the Secretary of Defense and others. When Lindsey Graham asked the Secretary in a hearing, uh, wouldn't this be like shooting ourselves in the foot? He said, no, Senator. It would be like shooting ourselves in the head. So I assume that we can stipulate that we can't allow it to happen. How do we fix it specifically? The Joint Select Committee was given a job to do because in the Budget Control Act, we were only able to address discretionary spending which amounted to a savings of a little under a trillion dollars. And we had to get to about two and a half trillion. And so the idea was that the other part of the budget, the big part, two thirds, needed to be addressed, and that was the mandatory side, the so-called entitlements. Defense, as Lindsay said, already gave it the office. A total of uh, just under half of a trillion dollars 467 billion or thereabout, if you count up the different pieces that defense was asked to give on over a 10 year period. So defense was a big part of that almost trillion dollar savings on the discretionary side of the budget. And when Republicans went into the Joint Select Committee, our assumption was that now we need to turn to the mandatory side of the budget. We ought to be able to get $1.2 trillion in savings from the mandatory side of the budget. That would require us to deal with some of the entitlement programs. The reason that the Joint Select Committee didn't work is because, as we found out later, our Democratic friends didn't look at it that way. They came at the problem from a totally different perspective. For a long time, they had tried to get the Bush tax cuts repealed. They tried to get a big tax increase in place. 1.5 trillion, 1.3 trillion, the president used different amounts, but that was the range. They viewed the Joint Select Committee as the way to achieve their goal. And that's why you heard that talk about going big, a $4 trillion deal, 1.5 trillion of which could be a tax increase. But when we realized that that was the game that they were playing there, we were appalled because we realized, first of all, they weren't serious about entitlement reform. Secondly, we weren't going to kill the economy by uh, imposing a huge new tax increase. Remember, it was just after the Joint Select Committee reported that we could not come to a conclusion that the President offered and we agreed to extend all of the 2001-2003 tax rates because, as the President said, it would be a blow to the economy if we didn't extend those tax rates. And yet, that is precisely what our Democratic friends on the Joint Select Committee were insistent on doing just a month or so before, when the committee finally concluded its, its work unsuccessfully. Well, if you can't find the savings from entitlements, and obviously we were not going to raise taxes, what could the Joint Select Committee do? We found about $190 billion, give or take, in a combination of discretionary and mandatory revenue possibilities. And they included things like increasing fees of the Pension Guarantee uh, Board, of the Fannie and Freddie 
uh, financing uh, fees. Of, uh, one of them that wasn't adopted, pretty controversial, was a TSA fee, some things like that. Selling property. We sold the spectrum at an auction, and the federal government made a lot of money on that. That was one of the things. It turns out that a lot of the things we proposed for revenue to the federal government have now been <laughs> taken off the table. They've been, we, have, we have put them in other spending bills as offsets, and so a lot of those things are no longer available to us. Of that originally, maximum potential of $190 billion, I doubt that there's half that much still available out there. Lindsay mentioned real estate sales. There, there is an enormous amount of federal land. Do you know how much federal land the United States owns in the United States of America? Would it surprise you to know that it's over one-third of all of the land? All right, there's a lot of surplus land in there. We can't even take care of what we have. We can sell a lot of that land. There are a lot of ways you can increase revenue. But our Democratic friends had a new definition of revenue. If it's not taxes, it's not revenue. We don't want to hear about it. So we couldn't count those other ways of gaining revenue. So at the end of our negotiation, toward the end, Pat Toomey came up with an idea, and all of the Republicans presented this to our colleagues. We said, OK, it is too important to let this enterprise fail, we will put statically scored tax revenues on the table, meaning this isn't growth in the economy revenues. This is we're going to tax you more, and the money you pay the federal government will be new tax revenues. Well, the Democrats wanted to get it from the wealthy. We said, OK, we'll take it all from the wealthy. And so, in effect, what we did, and this is a gross generalization, we took away from everybody in the top two income tax brackets all of their deductions, credits, and exemptions. There were a couple of different proposals. One of them did not include the uh, value of health insurance provided by your employer. But except for that, they're all taken away. Charitable deduction, your home mortgage deduction, state and, 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 uh, state and local income tax, all the rest of it. And that produced about $250 billion. It might have produced up to about $300 billion. Um, most of the people who itemize are in the upper two brackets, though not everybody. And so we reduced the value of deductions, credits, and exemptions for everybody. And by doing that, we were able to reduce everybody's rates by not quite 15%. Our thought was, well, we're reducing everybody's rate. Uh, we're taking away all of the, quote, loopholes from the wealthy. We're putting $250 billion on the table of tax revenue. In addition to that, there's about $100 billion that the CBO will score as revenue effect, money saved by an easier compliance with the tax code and so on. And we had an additional $50 billion in uh, other revenues. And so we had, uh, at the end of the day, about a $400 billion tax and a little bit of revenue proposal that we put on the table. That wasn't good enough. One reason it wasn't good enough is because even with that reform of the tax code, we were going to allow the 0103 policy that's been in existence for a decade now to continue. And why did we insist on that? Because otherwise, we would have been increasing capital gains, dividends, the estate tax, and increasing the top two brackets, all of which would have had a direct effect on the economy, on businesses, on job creation. CBO has confirmed that. The president himself acknowledged that just a month or two after we finished our work. Our idea was how to raise tax revenue without hurting businesses and job creation. And we thought we found a way to do that. It whacked the upper class, the, the top two brackets, but uh, it didn't directly affect their investment in, in their, their small business, for example. It didn't work. So the committee did not. Um, uh, reach a result, even though Dick Durbin, my counterpart, said that this was a breakthrough in our negotiations. So then we were stuck with a situation in which each year, for 10 years, 
we have to come up with a, approximately $109 billion in offsets or savings or revenue to meet the eventual 10-year goal of $1.2 trillion, which is part of the Budget Control Act. That's why we're in the fix that we're in. That's why Lindsay talked about $109 billion. We have to do that every year for 10 years. Either that or violate the Budget Control Act and not save that $1.2 trillion. And we do want to try to affect that savings. Well, Buck McKean is here, Chairman of the House Armed Services Service Committee. They did their job over in the House of Representatives, along with Paul Ryan and others. They passed a, a budget and a bill which included a variety of mechanisms from six different committees to offset the cost of that $109 billion. We introduced legislation here, Senator McCain and I, Ayotte, Graham, uh, Cornyn, and others that uh, would have saved the $109 billion. And uh, Buck has a separate bill that would have done it in a similar way. And how did, the, how did we do it? Well, we tried to take a page out of the uh, Simpson-Bowles Commission. One of the things they said is for every three employees that leave the federal workforce for whatever reason, just replace one of them. That saves you $120 billion over, uh, the, uh, over a 10-year period of time, and you can offset the $109 billion with that. We said, we're not going to be that draconian. We love federal employees. We're going to replace two for every three. Well, that raised us more than half of what we needed. And the other thing we did was to extend the president's own freeze on wage increases for federal employees. Uh, we extended it to, I believe, the middle of uh, June of 2014. That was all that was needed to achieve the $109 billion this year. Now, there are other ways you could do it. There are an infinite number of other ways you can do it. You can go after entitlement reform. You can do a lot of other things. My point in illustrating this to you is to just show that it is a bogus argument to say we can't get there without raising taxes. Now, here's the one area where I'll disagree with Lindsay and then get ready for my conclusion here. Um, it is harder than you think to raise one-third of this money all in one year by eliminating, quote, loopholes. In fact, I will posit to you that that's impossible. We found that it was hard enough to do it with the savings over 10 years. So you're, you're not going to be able to do it by, quote, uh, uh, reducing loopholes or, or so-called tax expenditures. And that's one of the reasons why the Democrat approach here is an unrealistic approach. You could have done those things over a 10-year period. You can't do that in a one-year period. And I guarantee you that none of our constituents are going to stand for absolutely eliminating their home mortgage deduction and their charitable deduction um, in order to offset the savings in this one year, even if uh, it could work to that effect. So we have to be more creative than that. I'm not against finding some revenues, and if they can find some kind of tax loophole, it'll raise some, some revenue. That isn't, that represents bad policy anyway. Somebody had mentioned the ethanol tax credit. I agree, get rid of it. If that saves us some money, that's fine. Uh, and there may be some other things out there like that. But the point is, we've got to come to a resolution of this issue before the lame duck session, because if we do not, the pressure to make a deal in the context of raising all of the tax rates to prevent the fiscal cliff on January 1st will be so great that I'm afraid defense will end up suffering, or we're going to have to end up raising taxes to an extent that would be very, very damaging to the economy. So that's how we got here, the way forward. And I echo Lindsay's charge to you, if you agree with us that defense is the number one objective of the federal government, that peace through strength is what has kept our country safe, and that we can't afford to allow these draconian cuts to defense and the other parts of the budget that would have the cross cuts, Join us in an effort to bring public attention to the issue sufficient that pressure will be brought to bear on our colleagues to find a solution and get the solution done before the lame duck session. I can't think of anything more important. As Teddy Roosevelt said, this is work worth doing. Thank you all very much.